All right. Well, good evening, gentlemen. Let's go ahead and open up, please, to uh, Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. I'm going to go ahead and get right into my slides here uh, tonight and have a little bit of review always built into my slides. But uh, maybe we can start a little bit by with uh, some class participation. I know you guys have had uh, some pizza to weigh you down, but you've got enough gummies and sugar in you to, I think, to give you a little bit of energy. What have we been talking about thus far? Uh, we came through, um, you know, we are so far through verse 8 of chapter 6. So in the first uh, five and a half chapters or so. Uh, what do we uh, what do we got going on? What are the first things that come to mind when you think of uh, the book of, of Hebrews? So warning. Warnings. Okay. Good. Warning about what? Uh, about your faith. No. Okay. Yeah, we've seen a couple of them. In fact, this is the third warning that we're here in in, uh, in chapter six. <clears throat> think of a uh, uh, the the first couple. I think uh, the first one in chapter two as uh, remember the author it starts and comes through chapters 1 and 2 talking about how Jesus is greater than the angels and greater than the Torah, greater than the law that was given by the angels. And so there in chapter 2 he warns and says, hey, uh, you know, be mindful because how will you um, survive if you neglect such a great salvation, right? You won't. So if the angels brought the law and you hold them in high regard and there's punishment and consequences for not being obedient to that, Imagine the consequences if you don't listen to and take heed to the greater messenger who brings the gospel of, of truth uh, that saves people. And so he warns them to take heed. He, again, remember, uh, second warning comes after, if you remember chapters 1 and 2, uh, it's about Jesus, remember, being superior, right? It's kind of the theme of Hebrews, the supremacy of Christ, that he is superior or greater uh, than all these things. And so we talked about the angels in the, in the law. Uh, what are the next couple things he unpacks? Uh, think about chapters 3 and 4. What are the next uh, things he compares to, if you guys remember? Jesus is greater than what? What else is Jesus greater than? Angels, law, we got that. What else have we seen? Prophets, good. Certainly greater than the Moses. prophets. Hmm? Moses. Moses, yep, good. Yeah, it certainly, I think of Jay, uh, Hebrews starts off right with that, right? So showing right in verse 1 and 2 that Jesus is superior, as it says, um, you know, in, in times past, in many different times, in many different ways, God has chosen to reveal himself to mankind through the prophets and the apostles. And then he says, remember, in these last times, he has chosen to reveal himself through his son, Jesus Christ. And so even in that, showing that Jesus is superior to the prior revelation of God right, of the prophets and the apostles. Uh, Moses, as Jim points out, that was what we saw in verse, or excuse me, chapters uh, 3 and 4, that Jesus is superior or greater than Moses, and uh, as well as Joshua, remember, and the promised land. Uh, and so that was his next warning, comes in, in chapters 3 and 4 there to say, hey, look, uh, those who were out in the wilderness with Moses, what happened to most of them? They died out in the wilderness, right, because of their unbelief. Because they, they hardened their hearts, remember, and would not believe. And so he said, do not harden your hearts, right? Today, uh, do not harden your hearts, but listen to God's voice. Don't be as uh, the children in the wilderness the, of Israel, that they perished because of their unbelief. Don't be like them, right? Another warning. So these warnings, you guys, are really what? What's the purpose of the warnings? Because remember, I told you, we're going to see more. There's, I think I've got five warnings in the book of Hebrews. Okay, so we're going to see a few more. So why are these, what are these warnings all about? Why are these warnings peppered throughout here? There are warnings about your faith. Yeah, and warnings to belief, right? right. Um, so this is, uh, remember, this is essentially a sermon, okay? This, is, this letter is really just a sermon, uh, and it's very um, evangelistic, okay? We see a lot of... Uh, chapter chapter three or chapter four where he says I think the beginning of chapter four where he says consider Jesus you know consider Jesus this is part of the warning think of Jesus think about Christ he is the one that the angels in the Torah are about he is the one that Moses uh, foretold and, and foreshadowed that remember Moses said there will be another prophet like me who you will listen to and we know that he's speaking of Jesus and that's a fulfillment of some of the Psalms and so you know this is the Christ and so uh, the warnings in here are to tell people, you've been doing this, you've been doing this, you've been doing this, 
and you've been doing this, and all the examples we've listed so far have been what? Angels, Torah, right? The law, Moses, Israel. This is all, remember, Old Testament stuff, because who's the primary audience of this letter and of this uh, sermon? The Jews, right? Hebrews, right? It's the name of it. So certainly it's applicable to us some 2,000 years later, right? And to, to all. Uh, but he was writing with a specific group in mind, and that's always the case with uh, the New Testament letters and, and with anything in the Bible. But in the New Testament, remember, these letters are first and foremost written to a specific audience. And so we want to keep context in there. Uh, but then is there application of context for us? Yep, certainly there is. And through every generation and time period of, of church throughout church history. Okay, so uh, with that being said, we've now come through... That then, when we get through chap, when we get to chapters five, uh, through chapter five, six, and seven, we start talking about uh, how Jesus is the superior high priest. Remember that another Old Testament thing, right? The sacrificial system and the high priest, and we point to uh, Melchizedek, right? We've talked about him a little bit, and we're going to see him uh, next couple weeks also as we get back into to that, the end of chapter six and uh, in chapter seven. And so Melchizedek, this, this character, this person that we met that is a type or a foreshadowing of Christ, that Melchizedek, remember, was the uh, king of Salem, right? He is the king of Salem, and his name means king of peace, right? And that he is the high priest of the most high God. And so in Melchizedek, we see that he is a priest and he is a king. And that points to Jesus, who is king of kings, lord of lords, and is our great high priest, who not only makes the sacrifice for us, as the high priest, remember, would make the sacrifice on behalf of the people. Jesus is that high priest that does that for us, but Jesus is also the sacrifice, right? He makes propitiation, and he is the propitiation, okay? So he is greater than, we'll see that going forward too, he's greater than all the Old Testament sacrifices, and all and just everything that we've seen so far is Jesus is better. Jesus is better. Jesus is better. Here's the big neon sign of whether it's Moses, the high priest, the sacrifices, the law, all of it's just one big neon sign, and it's pointing at Jesus Christ, <laughs> right? That's, that's his point. And so he says, don't miss it. Don't miss it. Don't harden your heart, but believe uh, that this is who all that is pointing to. And so he uses that Old Testament knowledge that he knows they will have to point them to the direction to say all that was about this guy. Make sense? Were there like 240 prophecies that he fulfilled from the Old Testament? Yeah, Brooke, I would say even higher. Um, you know, and there's really a large gap in that number, but most, you know, most scholars and studies that I've ever seen have said it's over 300. Some would say like 600. Um, but certainly there's been counted well over 300 uh, prophecies that Jesus fulfilled, right, of the Old Testament. Good point. Okay, good. So here we are in the middle of this. Now, as I say that, we're in the middle. Remember at the end of chapter 5, we saw how we talked a lot about this last week again. Um, that Talking about Melchizedek. Look at verse 11 there in chapter 5. We have much more to say on this, but it's hard to explain since you become dull of hearing. And remember, he goes on to say, you guys ought to be my teachers by now, uh, but you're still needing the milk. Right? Sounds very similar to what Paul says to uh, Corinth, right? In 1 Corinthians. You guys should be teachers. You should be much more mature than you are now. You're not mature. You weren't ready for the milk when I was here to give it to you. You're still not ready for the milk. Wake up. Grow up. It's time to grow up and put on our big boy pants, right? We're, we're playing big boy football here, right? This isn't tag football. This isn't touch football. Uh, this is real deal. Get strong. Hit the weights. Put your uniform on. Strap up. Sky, put your helmet on. Get in the game. This is big boy football. Let's go. Grow up and, and get into it. Okay? Um, so that's what he's saying to them. Remember, he encourages them in the next couple verses of chapter 6, saying, we got to mature out of those, remember, those foundational elementary doctrines of Christ and doctrines of the faith. And he lists, remember, six there having to do with repentance and faith. Uh, and then some of them with baptisms, laying on hands. And then some of them do with eschatology and the final judgment, the resurrection of dead. And he says, all that's foundational. That should be fundamental, and you should know that stuff by now, and you should be teaching the other people this by now. And so isn't that our goal? You guys, there's some applications in, that, in us for that right there, right? That our goal is to grow in the faith and mature in the faith so that we can then also 
teach other people uh, in the faith. It's not that just preachers and just pastors uh, are the ones to teach. That's certainly the role in the corporate church, right? But what about when we leave this room and when we leave the church? Uh, you guys have your own families and your own children and your own neighbors and your own co-workers, right? You guys are to be growing up and maturing. I'm to be growing up and maturing, and we're to take that out into into the world and, and to do that, right? That's, uh, that's kind of the goal. Um, you know, I remember, I think it's MacArthur uh, said something to the degree of, you know, when you're discipling and, and you're growing in your faith, you need to, to make sure, look, go find someone that knows more than you and be around them all the time and learn. Go find someone that knows less than you and teach them everything you know. <laughs> That's it. You see it? Higher, lower. You're somewhere. Find someone. Uh, okay, I'm going to go spend a lot of time with Jay because he can mentor me. He can disciple me. He can grow me because he's more mature than I am. But I've also been in my walk a little bit to where I can say I'll go to Matt and I'll spend time with Matt and I'll disciple him up and teach him the things that I know and that I'm learning. It, that's what we do, right? That's, that's iron sharpening iron. Uh, that's disciple making, okay? And so um, all that just to say uh, uh, I'm getting my preaching in tonight, but uh, I'm all amped up. I didn't even have any pizza. I did have a little Dr. Pepper. So... Uh, but that's that's where we are. We're in the middle of this thing. We're coming through those first couple verses, and here's the key. Last week we spent our time in verses four uh, to to eight, and that was remember all the language of this the these language. Remember we see that those who have been enlightened. Remember that once been enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they have tasted of the heavenly gift. They have shared in the Holy Spirit, right? They have tasted the goodness of the word of God. And it says, for those who do that, and then they fall away, it is impossible for them to come to repentance and be saved. And so all last week we unpacked just those couple of verses to say, um, you know, this is talking about a falling away that is not referring to what we might call as backsliding, right? That we're, we're falling out of our faith a little bit. We got unplugged a little bit. Uh, we, we lose fellowship a little bit with Jesus because of our sin. If, if you're caught up in some sin and you feel that distance, right, I'm sure every one of us has been there multiple times probably. In our, if you've been a Christian for any amount of time, you've probably had those seasons in your life where, you know, you're caught up in sin, you're caught up in other things that, that you're not focused on, and they're, they're creating this gap between you and the Lord, right? And so we don't want that to happen, and we have this gap in our fellowship with Christ, but we're not losing our salvation in that right if we're saved we're saved and as he says in john 10 no man can pluck him them out of my hand right if we, if you're a sheep you're his sheep then you're good uh, he died for his sheep but we understand that we can backslide and fall away in that sense but that's not what this uh context is saying and not what this verbiage means rather this is speaking to a falling away uh that's a complete falling away from someone who professes to have faith that even appears for a little while, remember Matthew 13, and, and the casting of the seeds, and it falls on, on this ground, and it, it takes root, and it springs up for a little bit, but then it falls away, and it doesn't produce a tree that produces fruit, and therefore it is, it is not a true good soil, which has produced a tree that produces fruit. So uh, this is someone who, who looks like a duck, walks like a duck, right, for a little bit of time, and then after a while, they denounce Christ, they reject Christ, and it comes to, to be known that they are not a believer. And again, last week I gave you, you know, some examples to say you can see that all over, uh, all over the world the last couple of years with Christian pastors of megachurches and, and, you know, people that have been writing Christian music for years and playing in bands. And, you know, they just come out and say, like, yep, I don't believe any of that stuff. It's nonsense. There is no God. I don't believe that. Uh, at all. And so it's just, you know, amazing to see those things, but we know that it does happen. So if someone falls away in this way, uh, they were never truly in the faith. That's the point, right? There, there's going to be a season. There's going to be a testing here of, of what we should perceive and what we see of, of other people. Uh, as you're discipling someone, are you seeing fruit? Are you seeing evidence of their conversion and, and going in the right direction? Uh, you know, and so it may be for a long time that it looks the same. And so uh, in that, you know, I don't think uh, we talked about this maybe last week, but in the parable of the wheat and tares in Matthew 13, you know, those seeds that are cast, uh, you can go online and look at pictures of like wheat 
and and tares, and they look the same up until a certain point. And that's the point: is the seeds look similar when they're germinating and they're just sprouting? They look the same, uh, and that's in that parable. Remember, the the guy comes and says, "Hey, I thought you put good seed in the in the." land right then why are these tares coming up and he says oh an enemy has done this and remember what he's asking him should we go and take them out and what's he say no, no. let them grow together till the harvest because they'll be distinguished between and they'll be separated and and they'll all go where they're supposed to go uh, but for a time you can't tell the difference in the wheat and the tares it's not until they start maturing a little bit more that you see the difference in them do you see the point of it that's one of the points of the parable uh to say that there are people that we will perceive look like Christians for some time, uh, but then if they're not truly believers, the time will come when their their faith is tested and, and they will fall away. Um, so that, that is certainly something we've probably all seen in our lives, but uh, Judas Iscariot is just a prime example of that, you know, and so... He was, he was gifted with the Holy Spirit. He was given the power of the Spirit to heal people, to cast out demons. He walked with Jesus for his time of ministry, and yet we know he was never saved, and he's in hell. So there, there's a perfect example for you, that he was the one that stole and, and was a, a liar and a thief and betrayed the Lord. Uh, and, and, you know, God used him, right, as a tool uh, to kill Jesus. Okay, and that's our last slide, I think, of review from last week. Those who are uh, true in the faith, they will persevere in the faith. Okay, those who are truly saved, and that's what John 10 is all about there in that, that text. You should have that from last week, John 10, 25 to 29, is, uh, is talking about that. And that whole chapter, I mean, John 10 is just an amazing chapter, the good shepherd, right? I'm the good shepherd, I'm the door, my sheep hear my voice, they follow me, uh, I call them by name. Uh, another they will not follow you know it's there's just so much uh, depth to to the things in, in the book of John there in chapter 6 and chapter 10 in particular uh, but no man can pluck them out of my hand right if you're saved and you're one of his sheep then you're saved and that's that's the point you're a child of God okay if you're a sheep you're not a goat but also if you're a goat you're not a sheep right and that's what he said to the Pharisees there in chapter 10 he says to them you don't believe me because you're not my sheep. So if you're born once, you die twice. If, you, if you're born twice, then you die once. Amen. That's indeed correct. I like that statement. All right, well, let's, uh, let's get into it tonight here. Guys, let's read. Um, let's start at chapter 6. Let's start at verse 1 just for context. And if somebody can read the first uh, 12 verses, that is going to be our goal. Who's got that? Can read it for us nice and loud, please. 6, 1 through 12. 1 through 12, yes, sir. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and a faith toward God, and of instruction about washings, the laying on hands, the resurrection of the dead, and the eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits, for it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted in the goodness of the Word of God, and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm, and holding Him up to contempt. For the land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it, produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated. Receiving, receives a blessing from God, but if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to be cursed, and is the end to be burned. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints, as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for this, this group. Thank you for this night. Thank you for this text. 
Thank you for the amazing gift of your word and the amazing gift of your spirit that uh, has converted us and caused us to be born again, continues to reveal the truths of your word to us. So we ask tonight that, that uh, your spirit would be our teacher and our guide in all that we have tonight. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. Okay, uh, you can go ahead and start flipping to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And so while we're making our way there, we've seen a, a couple different things as we've just left off with a good bit of review there. Um, to say there are those who, um, you know, will appear that they're in the faith and they're not. There are those we know, those who are truly in the faith uh, will persevere in the faith, and so they are truly saved. Uh, but again, there will be those who profess faith and are not truly of the faith, and that's what um, that I keep attesting and, and keep saying that that's what we believe is the context and the teaching of what the writer of Hebrews is saying here in chapter six. Even though the language, you know, might be confusing to some, uh, let's not be confused by that. And so let's look at uh, some of this. We're going to get into more of Matthew 7 a little bit later, too. But let's look at verse 21 to 23. This is Jesus um, saying here, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to what day? What is that day? Okay, good. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That's a pretty scary text, right? When you, when you come to that. Uh, I remember years ago thinking, what did that just say? So, there are going to be, not only are there those who we perceive and we see as believers that are not believers, right? So they've fooled us, uh, but understand they're not going to fool God, right? Uh, there, there are many who are going to actually fool themselves, is what, where this is going here. There are many who are, are fooling themselves, thinking that they actually are saved, and they're not. Uh, because why would that be? Why, what, is the, what is this group of people that we're talking about? Do you think that is the case? Like, how could somebody think that they're going to heaven, and yet they're not? Hypostasy, through learning, the, learning that they have to do this or that through works to okay. accomplish salvation. Good, and this warning, uh, good use of the word there. Thank you, sir. Apostasy, that's what this warning is about that we're talking about. Right, apostasy, falling away, false teachers, and all, and all those types of things. Yeah, and wouldn't that be pretty much what Sky says, sums it up. Wouldn't that be across the board religion? Uh, that, that there's many people who have been uh, told that they're good and they're going to heaven because they are good or because their good works outweigh their bad works, right? So they're earning uh, their keep, if you will, and so they're, uh, they're going to make it to heaven. Uh, or they may be even hoping, I hope I make it to heaven, um, but they're going to find out one day that they fall short because Romans 3.23 says exactly that, right? That all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So Jesus says, he says, I am the way, uh, the truth, and the life. You only get the life by believing and receiving the truth, right? That Jesus is the way. Um, so with that being said, there's going to be many who believe that they are going to heaven, and they're going to find out on that day that they're not. And, well, I did all these good works. Well, I did all these things. Uh, look, I prophesied in your name. I taught, I, I spoke the word of God in your name. Uh, these are preachers. These are teachers. These are people that, uh, you know, think that they're saved and they're teaching these things. Uh, and, and, you know, again, think of, think of Judas. So, uh, you know, it's, it definitely seems here that that's going to be a pretty large, look at verse 22. It says, on that day many will say. <laughs> many uh, so I think that's going to be a large group of people that are in this camp and so um, you know it's it's a very somber uh, and sobering couple of verses here for us to, to realize that okay one thing that, could, that confuses me is you can't read the Bible without the Holy Spirit dwelling in you well you can read it but I would say just to pick up maybe to help on the words there maybe you mean better Brooke that you can't really believe it Right, you can't really uh, you can't really understand it, right? Right, because right. we know that many secular people read the Bible, and there's there's secular people that know more about this Bible than I do. 
but to your point, Brooke, is they don't believe it because the Holy Spirit hasn't given them the, the ability to really truly understand it. You know, it's like there's times they say, Lord, you want to give me a message, tell me what's just on your mind. I pick up a verse out of the Bible and he's speaking through me. So. Yeah, and that's how he does it, right? Right. He and speaks to us he right that here. That's the Holy Spirit in me. That's right. That's right. That's why I get confused about why they would think they're saved. Oh, yeah. But, but again, to, to our point that many people think that they're saved by doing good works, right, and doing good things. And, well, and that's church, because, so. that's right, that's right. And so if they don't truly believe, right, the gospel, then they're not saved. But they think they are because of their good works and because of the things they're doing. So they think they're saved, but they're not. And there's going to be that to some of these false sects of Christianity. Yeah. Mormonism. Indeed. Indeed. And the, the problem for me is, uh, without going down a, a too big of a rabbit trail and pulling out my soapbox to jump on, uh, because it is one for me, yeah, I think all those things, which obviously, like you said, those sects, or I would even say cults, because Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, they're not Christians. Remember, as to use Sky's word, remember, uh, Roman Catholicism is an apostate church, that they actually were grounded in the truth of the gospel at one time, and they got away from it. But Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and all those, they were never in the truth. They're, they've been a lie and apostate from the beginning. And so, yeah, they're definitely part of that. But I, I, would, I would say, unfortunately, even large part, portions of the evangelical church is a huge contributor. The last 150 years or so, but certainly the last, I'd say, 50, 60 years, the evangelical church is the biggest one. Uh, to me, because of the e easy believism, the seeker friendlyism, all the stuff of ask Jesus in your heart, raise your hand, say this prayer, welcome to the family of God, you're saved. Do you know how many people have a false assurance and false hope of salvation because they've done that? So, because you said a prayer one time and you went and lived an ungodly life the rest of your life because there was no regeneration, there's no true conversion, you're, that person's saved? Well, no. We know that they're not saved. And so I would say to you that the Christian church, the evangelical church, has, and that's part of my problem with that whole methodology and that approach, because it's selling false assurance in not really grasping hold of God's sovereignty and salvation, which is why we are reformed and why we talk about it all the time. Because do you see the dangers in it? Do you see the dangers of that other side that we're talking about? Yep, just say a prayer and you're good. Well, there's going to be many one day sitting before Christ who said, I said a prayer. I asked Jesus into my heart, and he's going to say, I never knew you. So, yeah, I would say that goes in there, too. I think there's a lot you know, there's a lot in that in that pot. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, you think, like, people that are in that situation, it's harder to reach them because they think they're saved. But then my next thought is, <coughs> none of us can do it without him. He does the work anyways, and he That's can right. save whoever he wants. But it, it does seem like, it's like, man, they're... Right. It's harder to reach somebody like that. Right. Yeah, I've heard it said, like, well, and I've said it many times to say it's hard to save somebody who thinks they're saved. But to your point, God can do whatever he wants. But I totally understand the thought. Yeah. And, and we're not doing the same. We're not doing the saving anyway. Right. Indeed. Well, let's get back to Hebrews here. <clears throat> let's get back to this, this wording here in chapter 6, where he says, it's impossible did anybody catch that? Because remember, <laughs> actually, Brian, I think it was Brian, Matt, and I, Sunday morning, and Brian was reminding me that I, uh, that I said, hey, guess what? This was last week. Uh, that I looked up the meaning, you know, of the Greek words here behind impossible, and it means impossible. <laughs> like, yeah, it actually means it's impossible uh, and unable to be done. Okay, so what is unable to be done? What's impossible? He's saying those who that appear to have tasted of the Spirit, they've had all this stuff, they appear to be converted, but they're not. And now when they turn away and they fall away from the faith, it's saying it's impossible to bring them to repentance. Do you guys see that? So those people that say, I, I lost my faith, they'll never get it back again, something like that? They never had it. Possibly. That's right, because if they, if they say they lost their faith, we know that truly you don't lose your faith. They, they never had it. That's right, they never had it. And this text here says... To what you just said uh, that they may never get it again in fact it says it's impossible here for them to to not to get it again understand the verbiage they never had it but you know what i'm saying um so 
it says, because they crucified to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. They again crucify. Do you hear that? So let's unpack this a little bit. What does that mean? What does it mean that they crucify him again and put him to shame? What does that mean? Well, the Jews basically crucified Christ. They had him, and they killed him. And they, he, you know, he was talking directly to him, telling him the truth. I mean, they had him in some sense of the word more than we did. You know what I mean? Like he was there in real life. I don't know. That's kind of... So for this, though, now this wouldn't be, I would say this wouldn't be just to Jews, right? This would be application for, for anyone who shows these things, has this taste, falls away, denounces it, rejects it, and it's saying it's impossible for them to repent because it says that they crucify again, you know, Jesus, the Son of God. So any other thoughts on that? What does that mean? It's impossible for them to repent since they are crucifying once again the Son of God. Well, the reason why they crucify him in the first place is because of telling the truth. Okay. So how are they then they don't like the crucifying him again? He died for our sins, past, present, and future. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, once you were saying, I thought I heard you saying, right, once for all. Right. right? He did it once for all sin, right, for all those who who uh, would come to believe in him. But, you know, follow this thought process here, um, and maybe it'll be helpful. Because I think too many times we've said, as preachers, as teachers, you know, all of you have heard or possibly said even yourselves, you know, no one's beyond salvation. No one's beyond saving. Nobody's done too much that they can't be saved, right? We've all heard that. Uh, I've said that. Um, and then in context, I think I've, tried to reiterate what I mean by that because is that true according to the word of God is that the case or is there a line that is drawn that God says those people aren't savable sounds like it here well the second time they want to crucify him because they don't want to know the truth that could be um, but let's go back to the Back to the question. I don't, I don't think for him it's impossible. I think he's choosing to allow us. We've made that decision. And he's not willing to, you know, there comes a point where he just draws the line and says, well. Right. So then it's kind of like that thing Brian and I talk about this a lot, like our human language, you know, what we speak and what we say. But yet God's, on the other side of the coin, there's what God does and God's will. Um, because in our finite brains, I mean, we certainly don't know who, the, who are the elect and who are not, right? So that doesn't change our approach to what we do. But the Bible, like Sam said here, it certainly seems that that's the case. And I tell you, Romans 1 and 2 make it pretty clear and say that he turns them over to the reprobate minds, you know, and, and that they, you know, Thessalonians, Paul says that they will, uh, you know, he gives them strong delusion that they will believe a lie, right? If they're not elect, they're not going to be saved, um, so in that being said, then yes, there certainly is a point that people are not to be saved. So it's one of those big God sovereign can make your mind stir too much thing. But in our humanity, I would say to you, be steadfast in your prayer for your loved ones and for people for salvation. As I just say this and I think of, you know, some of my own family members and you think of where they are, what their lifestyle looks like and all those things to say, there is a point of no return. God's already made that point in times past. We understand that. But in our human brain, we can start to maybe sense those things. And so continue to tell the truth. Tell, continue to tell them the gospel and continue to pray that God will be gracious and save them. Because uh, that should just give us more of a sense of urgency to do exactly that that we're supposed to be doing. Uh, because we do see the scriptures say uh, that there is a line there. And, and certainly God has drawn it. But... You know, we don't know where that line is. So. Right, but hasn't he already made that line? Though? Exactly. Before that, we were even... Yep, imagined. exactly. So, again, that's part of the God the God talk right. that can make our brains right. blow up, because you're right. Yep. There's the two, the two sides have already been decided, right? right? Uh, but that's why we right. don't know what side George is on, right? right? And so we got to be steadfast and continuing to, to talk and to minister and to give the gospel and to pray and to pray, because we don't know. Right. It does sound... 
like more strict in this, you know, like it says impossible. Once that happens, it's impossible. But again, like you said, you think about somebody who never makes it to that point and goes back. And God chooses not to, you know, have them be one of the elect. It's impossible for them too. I mean, it's, That's right. It's it was all. It timing. was always yeah. to Jason's point. It was always impossible for them to believe, because we know it's impossible for men to believe. Period, without God intervening. Yes. So yeah. So again, we can always take it back to God's sovereignty. But again, we're not sovereign. We don't know those things. And so we continue to, to be obedient. But let's let's go down to this thought of why it's impossible, because it's saying they crucify Christ again. Uh, by their actions or by what they're necessitating and saying. So turn please to uh, Romans chapter 6. <clears throat> this one's probably familiar to a lot of you. I know we went through our Romans uh, study and Bible study a couple years ago. Uh, generally we do, and actually I'm thinking of you, Sky and Shannon, uh, when we did your baptism, this is usually my go-to, you know, this is a good baptism uh, passage here in Romans chapter 6 where Paul talks about what baptism is. And so... Uh, my point I'm trying to make is this crucifying of him again, because picture this. The, the, this person uh, who has tasted of the Spirit, has been a part of the church's doings, understands it, um, claims to have it, professes the faith, and now they don't, right? Now they reject. Excuse me. They've claimed salvation through Jesus' death on the cross, right? And so in that... They've proclaimed themselves to be crucified with him and to be, have been given new life by him. And that's what we see here in Romans 6. Let's look at it. Talking about here baptism, verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Jesus was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And that's the picture of baptism. You go under the water, and you're dying to your old self and to your sinful nature. And as you come out of the water, that's a picture of Christ's resurrection and the newness of life that you now have in Christ, <coughs> right? So he's saying that we have died with Christ, and that's what we do. Um, Galatians 2.20 uh, says, For I've been crucified with Christ. Right? That it is no longer I who lives, but it is Christ who lives in me, and this life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So we've been crucified with Christ. We are uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17. All things have become new, right? If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. That is, is who we are in Christ. So we partake of of his, his death and his crucifixion there, and he brings us this newness of life. So now, with that in mind, for a believer, if now somebody falls away and denies this, they're now, in effect, nullifying his death on the cross, that his substitutionary atonement, that, right, that's just big terminology for what? Substitutionary means he took the place of. Atonement, we've already talked about with the high priest, atoning for someone's sins, right, propitiation. So, that's what Jesus' death on the cross was, by the way, guys. That's theological terminology would be substitutionary atonement, right? He paid for your sins because you can't pay for them, so he did it, okay? Substitutionary atonement. So they're saying that didn't count, and he didn't do that. I know I said I believed it and that I was with him, but I'm not saying that that's, that's not what happened, and in effect it's saying he died justly, he was a criminal, he deserved to be crucified, like, do you see everything they're de denouncing and rejecting that they already said and, and claim they believe and are with, and they're partaking of this, even perhaps partaking of the Lord's Supper and, and communing with the church, and all the things that they're doing as, as they're acting this, this part, and now they're come out of it, they're saying it's all nonsense. Do you see it? And, and just saying, like, nope, it's all junk. It's all a lie that I've been living and I want you to know that it's been a lie and that I've been living a lie. So think about in order for them now to be saved, back in the context of Hebrews 6, there need to be another sacrifice made for them. Do you see the language now, the verbiage now? That they crucify Jesus again. Because they've now taken all that back and said, nope, that's all a lie, and rejected it. Now 
they're not walking in newness of life. They're now dead in their sins again. We, we understand they were never out of it, right? You with me? But just follow the, the language of, of what I'm rolling with here. They now aren't in newness of life, but they're now dead again. And they're now buried again and dead in their trespasses and sins again. That means what? They need another sacrifice. Is that they need to. like the Jewish religion? Huh? Thing? Sounds kind of like the Jewish religion. No, I mean, I'm speaking certainly of, of believers, you know, I'm speaking of the resurrection of Christ. Um, so the, the, the resurrection now, they would need another one because they would need to be raised in newness of life again. Do you see it? That's, uh, that's my best stab of trying to articulate this thought behind they crucify Christ again. Because why? They would need to crucify him again. He would need to die a substitutionary death again for them. Because they've already said that, that it, they've received it, and then they said, no, I deject it and denounce it. So to come back to it again and again and again, God says, nope, impossible. You're not shaming my son like that. You see it? That's not going to happen. Well, he did it once right. for all. Right, right. What does once for all mean in, in that actual verse, in that context? It doesn't mean once for all people, right? Because we know, for God so loved the world, John 3.16, we know that's not all the world. That means the world... Uh, all mankind, all kinds of peoples. Uh, it's a distinguishing factor between the, the saved and the unsaved. So when he says he died once for all, he died once for all believers, right? Once for all the sins of all who will believe in him. And so with that being said, you didn't believe in him, and you don't believe in him, and he's not going to die for you again. You're not going to shame him again. I think Luke was trying to say, like in the Old Testament, they needed to have daily sacrifices. That's not how it works. Yes. It works with Jesus. Right. Is that kind of what you were thinking? Yes. Right. So continual sacrifice yeah. over and it, over. It, uh, it's kind of like, you know, the, the, uh, the temple being built in Jerusalem. Gotcha. And they're sacrificing animals and waiting for yes. the Messiah. That's right. Yes. So, so now we're taking it back. So now you can understand the same type of principle with what you're saying, Brooke, is... We're in the New Testament, the New Covenant, and that's what the Hebrews writer is talking to them about. And so we don't go back to that, right? We don't go back now to that old covenantal system of those things because he's going to unpack as we move forward in this sermon. He's going to move forward to say, because all of that was, again, like Moses and the angels and the Torah and Joshua and the Promised Land. It was all pointing to Jesus. Even when we get the sacrifices and the sacrificial system and the high priest, all of it's moving into the New Covenant, the better covenant, which is in the blood of Christ. Yes, sir. So, just kind of leaning back into like the, the, how the Jewish people, like this letter is to Hebrews, it's to the Jews, but it's to, it's to Jews that believe in Jesus and as being the Messiah. It's not a letter to Jews who don't believe in Jesus as the Messiah because, Good. you know, like in the Old Testament, they did partake in the Holy Spirit right? Oh, like sure. They did taste of it. They did partake in it. Sure. But then, then they're slapping Jesus in the face and saying, you're not the Messiah. You know? Right. Yeah, and, and also, remember, um, everything you said is, I think, right on point, this guy. And then I would just add to it to say, remember that even as we keep talking about, you know, the book of James in that study we just went through with similar parallels here, and even today in our churches, that yes, while it's written to the church, right, and to Jewish believers, it's also written and spoken to unbelievers, Unbeliever. right? Unbeliever. So they're Unbeliever. unbelievers, period, Jew, Gentile, whatever, because there's always going to be that audience, and that's why you see James stressing and talking to both. That's why you see Hebrew writers uh, stressing and talking to both, and that's why he's saying, hey, wake up. Today's the day. Don't sleep and, and, and consider Jesus, and don't harden your hearts. Who is he talking to when he says that? Non-believers, right? Come to the Lord. Consider Christ. Don't harden your hearts. Believe today. Right. So he's writing just, you know, as Pastor Brian preached yesterday, you know, and, and preaches the gospel. And as I even, even as I start to get fired up here, because when I preach and I preach the gospel, it fires me up. And you guys hear me on Sundays doing it. Why do we preach that? It's not because I think, oh, well, John's not saved or Sky's not saved. I don't care who's there. I don't have, and maybe you're not. And that's the point. I don't know. You know, I don't know your hearts. Uh, but somebody who may be hearing and listening may need to hear the gospel to be saved. So regardless of how many people you think are saved in your, in your church or not, you should always be taking to the gospel, right? And even if you are saved, 
uh, as I always continue to say, is you need the gospel too. We all need the gospel. You should be fired up every time you say the gospel to someone. You should be fired up every time I preach the gospel. The gospel is what we're all about. That's what gets us energized. That's who we are. If believers get hardening their heart to hearing the gospel, and I think too many in the church do, that's a, that's a big problem, man. Uh, that's a big problem to say, like, yeah, I've heard that 50 times. You know, I've heard that 5,000 times. No, the gospel should always, it's for you. It's for the unbeliever to be saved, but the gospel is for you. Never forget what Jesus did for you. <laughs> you know? My mom couldn't even tell the gospel without crying every time. Oh. Like, you know. Hey, man, dude. I remember. I seen her do it. Yep. I've been there saying it. I've, I've stopped praying and speaking because I can't even get my words out because you're tearing up. Yeah. Yeah, that's the brokenness of, of who we should, you know, uh, of who we should be. And the gospel should continue to do that, I pray, for us always, even for believers. And, and that should create a sense of urgency for us, right, as believers, to share the gospel. <laughs> yeah, this excitement, this crying thing, this emotional thing, like, you want other people to have that. I want other people to have that excitement about the gospel and about Christ and about eternal life and eternal things and things that matter and not things of this world, right? Well, that's why the words are living. Amen. And you get something different every time you hear it. Amen. Good. So I think uh, that's kind of where we are on that thought, you know, that they would need to put Jesus um, to the cross again. And so, you know, that's not going to happen is what God is saying. So now, uh, if, you, if you notice when we read through, look at verses 7 and 8. Did those kind of ring any bells or sound familiar? Um, we're going to go back to Matthew 7 now because it, it, it definitely parallels some of the parables we see and then what we see also in Matthew 7. You can go ahead and turn there, and as you do, I'll just read Hebrews 7 and 8 for you. Listen to it. It says, For the land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. So you see where I'm going this, with this? Let's go to Matthew 7. Does that sound like anything or ring a bell uh, to any of these words that Jesus has said that you can think of? Right? Doesn't it sound like wheat and tares, sheep and goats, parable of seeds, right? It, it's all the similar language, okay? We're talking about the same thing. We're talking about uh, believers and unbelievers. Verse 7 is a picture of a believer. Verse 8 is a picture of an unbeliever. You see it? One takes the water and produces the fruit that it's cultivated for. The other one produces thorns and thistles and is being burnt. You see it? So let's let's go see what Jesus says about it. And the Lord blesses both believers and unbelievers. Yeah, certainly the what we would call the benevolence love of God. Yeah, just God's goodness. That, remember, the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike, right? God is good. Period, because He's good. He's good to everyone. Uh, it doesn't just rain on Sam's house because he's a believer and his neighbors don't get water and they don't get fed and they don't get provided for. No, God is love and He is good that even it overflows into all of creation, that's what we call the benevolence love of God. That's separate and different than the agape love of God that he has for the elect, right? That, that's the difference. He loves and is good in, in his benevolent sense because he is good, but the real love and the true love and the mercy and the grace and all that is for the elect that the others do not get. He goes further than that. You think about Joseph and how he was so blessed and overflowed to the Yeah, to others. Everybody got a bit. That's exactly right. And that's the benevolence of, of God. That's right. So let's look at uh, Matthew 7. And uh, verse 13 we'll start out here. One of my all-time favorite passages, man. Matthew 7. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. I mean, that just sums up everything for you right there, right? We are the few, the elect are the few. Uh, many are called, but few are chosen, is what Jesus says in other place about this. Okay, so verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in, sheep, uh, in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? 
So every healthy tree bears fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Here he repeats that for emphasis. You'll know them by their fruits. 21. That's what we just read. Not everyone says to me, Lord, Lord. Okay, so... Narrow gate, wide way, path to destruction, right? Many versus few. Excuse me, you'll know them by their fruits. And here's the talk of the trees. Every healthy tree, every good tree, produces good fruit. Bad trees produce bad fruit. Bad trees do not produce good fruit, and good trees do not produce bad fruit. And any tree that does not produce good fruit is cast into the fire. That's pretty easy analogy and imagery, right? This isn't the only place we get it. We get it in other places. What does that mean? It means they're a slave to righteousness or a slave to sin. Amen. Which means in, simple, in simplistic terms means what? Believers, unbelievers, right? Believers, unbelievers, and which ties back into our James study of how will you know a believer from an unbeliever? A few ways that I can think of because Jesus said you'll know them by their love for one another. Right? But think in the context of what James says, how do you know a believer? What does James say? Right? Fruit. Evidence. Right? The evidence of their faith. And that's what the fruit is that he's talking about here. Which tells us, and, and from this is where I would say, I would stake my claim and say that's the, uh, one of the proof texts here of casting the seeds, right? In the four grounds, only the one ground is believers. It's not, this isn't a carnal Christian and a worldly Christian and blah, blah, blah. No. One of the four grounds is good soil that produces what? A tree that produces fruit. The other three do not produce trees that bear fruit. And what does Jesus say? Only trees that bear good fruit are believers. The rest are cast into the fire. I want to talk about preaching fire. We could preach some fire and brimstone with Matthew 7 now. So... Let's be encouraged, though, and we should be encouraged with that anyway. Also, fire and brimstone isn't a bad thing, right? That's bringing the reality of here's where you are without Jesus, and then as the writer of Hebrews says, consider Jesus and be saved. You need fire. You need to understand there's fire there, because why? You need to be saved from it. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's not be confounded by this. Let's not be confused by this warning. You know, believers do have eternal security, okay, in Christ, and cannot lose their salvation um, okay, I'm sorry, I'm going to skip forward just to see how many more. Oh, yeah, i got a good little bit going on. Okay, so I'm going to, for the sake of time, have you write those down because we talked about them a little bit last week, and I've referred to them already tonight. Uh, John 6 there, 37 to 39, and John 10, 25 to 30. But both those talk about, uh, you know, John 10 being my sheep, no man can pluck them out of my hand. Same thing with John 6, that there is eternal security in the Lord, okay? We don't have to worry about our salvation, okay? However, with that being said, we also recognize, let's go back to Hebrews 6, that, uh, where is that? <coughs> yeah, there it is. Um, that we have a responsibility in this, right? To persevere in the faith. And look back at verse 1 of chapter 6. It says, uh, lead us, lead the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on into maturity. You see it? We have a responsibility to press on, to go on into maturity and to grow up in our faith. And so there is uh, human responsibility and accountability that comes with that. I'm going to pass out a few of these. Um, guys, if, if we can uh, take some of these and, and read them. And you can certainly flip there if you're fast. Uh, but we must pay a close attention to the teachings, right, to the doctrine of Scripture. Jay, would you mind getting 2 Corinthians 13, 5? Sky, could you get uh, 2 Peter 1, 10, and 11? And John, would you get Philippians 2, 12, please? While you guys write those down, and uh, if you're a quick flip, you can get there. But let's see, uh, see what these writers here in the New Testament have to tell us about this. 2 Corinthians 13, uh, 2 Peter 1, 10, and 11. Yeah, 2 Corinthians, uh, Jay, did you have that? 2 yes. Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves? 
that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you are disqualified. Okay, so yeah, pay, pay attention, right? Know that you're in the faith. Uh, how? By examining yourself. Examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourself against the Word of God. Say, am I exhibiting fruit? Do I believe these things? Do I live these things? Uh, am I convicted by things that I'm not doing or I am doing? Uh, we should all be examining ourselves to see where we are. Uh, Second Peter, one. Uh, wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay, good. So the key there in, in 2 Peter 1 is, uh, he says, Be all the more diligent to do what? To confirm your calling and election. Confirm it. Examine yourself. Are you saved? Confirm that and know that and know that you are by the fruit, by the evidence, by the Holy Spirit that convicts you and convinces you of the truth of the Word of God and, and this transformation that you continue to see in your life. Uh, Philippians 2.12 So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. There you go. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That doesn't mean work out your salvation like work for your salvation. It means work on your salvation. It means your sanctification process. It means continue in that work. Uh, and then Philippians 1, uh, I think right before that, Paul says that. It says, he who begun a good work in you will continue it. Okay? Uh, and now we've got to, to work on that and continue in it ourselves. Okay, let's get back to uh, Hebrews 6. The time flies so fast. Once it hits 8.30, it seems like it goes double time. And I'm like, man, but that's all right. We're never under a time constraint, so we leave off where we leave off. Verse 9, he says, but beloved, and I just heard that word in one of the verses you guys just read too, beloved. Okay, so even with that, he says, beloved, okay, after this warning, after talking about the two groups, after the impossible for you to fall away and to be saved, showing that this warning is in love, right? He's saying, beloved, the ones who I loved, okay, love. Um, he says that we are convinced of better things concerning you. So he's saying, look, of all this stuff I'm talking about, verse 8, the thorns, the thistles, uh, you know, all those things, we consider you better. We consider you not to be in that camp of the thorns and thistles, not in the camp of it's going to be impossible for you to be repenting again. He's saying we consider you to be the ones who are drinking up the rain and who are bringing forth the fruit. So he's assuming and saying, we perceive the works that you're doing, and we perceive and hope a better thing for you than what I just explained to you, the warning I just gave you of, don't do that. We perceive that there's better for you, okay? That you are uh, sheep and not goats. We perceive that you are wheat and not tares, okay? Uh, and so he's saying that and trying to encourage them, okay? Uh, he's saying that they perceive these works and that accompany salvation, which according to, there's a reference there, James 2, 14 to 18, and that's exactly what James is talking about, that there are things that accompany salvation. There are natural byproducts of salvation, right, guys? What would those things be? Fruit. Hmm? Fruit. Fruit, good. And Hope. so, what, what? Hope. Hope, yep, good. What else? You know, knowledge that. Good. No matter how bad the world gets, this is an imprint. Uh, permanent resident here. Good. Peace, comfort, joy. Those things that we part yeah, of. right. Fruit of the Spirit, right? Galatians 5. Uh, the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, faith. Right? Those things should be evident. The, the good works that we do, you know, the reason why we do them is because. We're trying to be more like Christ and, and love other people. So, yeah, those should be evidence. And so the writer is saying, yep, we, we see this, okay? And this is, this is my hope. This is our hope. Uh, the, the, the evidence that we see, the works you're doing, the joy, the love, the hope, all those things that we see and perceive in you, we believe are fruits of conversion. And so with that, I would say to us, we... <laughs> You know, how can I say it? Maybe we shouldn't make it harder for people 
to get into heaven than it is for us or was for us, right? Uh, you see fruit, you see evidence, you see someone's plugged in a Bible study, they're coming to church, they profess Christ. You know, let's, let's perceive that they are Christians and that they are believers and treat them like believers and pray that they are believers. Disciple them, grow them, keep them plugged in. Uh, that way, if they're truly not believers, perhaps the Lord uses those things that you're now teaching them and, and training them and telling them they're now hearing the truth and maybe they become converted. So, yeah, certainly we don't just be like, man, you know, Matt, I know that guy Jay has been coming to church for a long time, but dude, I don't really think he's saved. <laughs> you know, like that's, there's no reason for us to do that, right? Does it matter on that day that, we're, you know, on that day, they say to me, well, does it matter on that day who I thought of all you guys are saved and not saved? It matters zero. It matters less than zero. It doesn't matter who Sky thinks is saved and not saved right? That's God work. That's way above our pay grade. That's, that's not for me to figure out or have to even know to figure out in my humanity who, who is who. Is the Lord going to know who the wheat are and who the tares are? Yeah. Is he going to separate them one day? That's right. Examine yourself to know where you are. Know who you are. And then preach and teach and tell others the gospel and pray that they would be saved too. And pray that you see evidence among your children and among your parents and among your co-workers and the people that you believe are saved. Pray that there's evidence. Pray that there's fruit. That they endure and persevere in the faith, which is what true converts do. Right? You know, I hear from a lot of non-believers the reason why they don't want to convert to Christianity is because of Bible thumping, fault finding. Yeah. You know, yeah. It, it turns them off. You know? Sure. Or they've been hurt before by people in the church, you know, yeah, and other Christians. Sure. Not into that. It happens. And it, those things can definitely be true, you know, but, you know, there's a lot of justification there also that people, I think, do in their own, in their own minds that, you know, they don't, they don't want to do that stuff. And they'll feel convicted or, or whatever. But, yeah, it certainly could be a, a valid point. And, and hey, keep, keep telling them anyway. Keep praying. You know, keep praying the Lord will soften their hearts and they would be accepting. To really be a fault finder, Bible thumping, I think. Yeah, I beat him over the head with it. <laughs> okay. I'm well, just I playing, think, bro. I think a lot of There's the problem. A, a lot of the problem with that, though, is that we are we are supposed to treat unbelievers. We are supposed to treat believers differently. We are yes. supposed to hold them accountable to the faith that they claim they have. So, That's right. So if someone is claiming to be a believer, we are accountable to to hold them to what That's they right. claim. That's right. Um, so that might be where the judgment comes from, yep. but we are called to do that. That's right. So now if someone, if someone is living a life of an unbeliever, and then we, we don't hold them to the same truths of the gospel because they don't have that wisdom. I mean, right. Jesus will, God will, right. but we, we aren't called to. We're That's called right. to hold believers accountable. Yeah, so. we, should, we treat them totally different, right? Because we don't expect them to act how we know we're there supposed you go. to act. What would Jesus right. do? Right? What would he do? You know, I mean, he hung around <laughs> with all these liars and whores and yep. thieves and everything, and he didn't. He fault find him. Well, he did tell oh, he, he confronted a he confronted a lot of them yeah. on their sin and called them out for it and called a lot of them a lot of things. Yeah, Jesus. Yeah, Jesus, what? No. A little bit different than our hangout. <laughs> yeah. What? His hanging out was a little different than <laughs> humans. Yeah. yeah. He also told the disciples not to. Uh, Brush the dust off their feet or whatever. Yep. Like, leave those behind that won't. That's right. And I mean, I've had a lot of situations too where people, they, you know, almost attack you and they're like, oh, well, you think, you know, gay marriage is wrong or whatever, sure. you know, whatever the case may be. And, and yeah, I mean, you have to you say, yeah, I believe in the Bible. The Bible says it's wrong and I believe that. But I yep. mean, you know, I mean, sometimes it's, yeah, you're just kind of telling sometimes it's closer what you to do. Home, what I've had my parents come to me yeah. at my table in my house. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, my daughter. Very close to telling them to get out. Right. But sometimes it's not you Bible thumping somebody. It's just it is. It's, it's, a, it's a question that yeah. they pose. And yep. it's kind of coming at you. And you have right. To, so you have to and, and, do you stand, and do you stand for the truth? Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're convicted it's offensive. They, they haven't come to grips with it. And they're bringing it up. That's right. Because they're convicted about it. That's right. But Luke, Luke 6 uh, 45 is a good uh, thing that that way says that a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man. Out of the evil treasure of his heart, bring 
brings forth evil. That's right. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. That's right. And that's what it, that that's sums right. up in it. That's right. Two different worldviews right there. Yep, that's what we're talking about. And that's what Matt's talking about. That's what you're all talking about. That's exactly right. Yep. And then those who profess Christ and say they're believers, but yet are okay with things like that, that the Bible condemns and they condone it. You know, so there will be conviction for them in that. But that doesn't mean that we aren't supposed to stand for the truth. We are. Yeah, stand for the truth and pray that God will change them. But I'm not backing down off the truth of the Word of God. I mean, it doesn't mean we have to go to fisticuffs because I'm going to scream at you, but I'm, I'm going to tell you the truth of what God's Word says. And if you claim to be a believer and you believe something else, I'm going to tell you you're wrong. Here's what the Bible says about it. I just and I would expect someone to do that to me. I just blame it all on the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> hey, good on you. Hey, God can take it. God can take it. Pass it along. I was just telling you, I believe what it says. I didn't say it. Don't. Yep. Hey, and then, you know. My truth is God's truth. Yeah, God said it. Hey, you know, don't blame the messenger, right? But but God said that. You know, they don't, they don't hate you. They hate me. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. Yeah. So they may kill the messenger. <laughs> to live is die, you know. To live is Christ. To die is gain. So you're in a better place anyway. So that's right. So you know, it, it just it just is what it is. We're definitely coming to a point where that's going to, ha- and it does happen, you know, in this world every day. So, uh, but let's try to let's try to wrap up these last couple verses. Um, so he warns them here. He's just encouraging them, exhorting them to persevere in their faith. Right to know your faith, mature your faith, be grounded in your faith, be rooted in it. Uh, spring forward, you know, and produce fruit and grow in your faith. Okay, so uh, we talked about that. He proceeds the fruit, he exhorts them. Uh, then in verse 12, he says, so that you may not be sluggish. Now, this actually takes us back to um, verse, let me see, where is that? Because we talked about this a couple weeks ago. Look, look at verse 11, <coughs> verse 11, chapter 5. He says about this, about Melchizedek, it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. That dull of hearing, I told you that a couple weeks ago, is the same word in the Greek that is translated here in verse 12 as sluggish. Sluggish, dull of hearing. Uh, You know, you're dull, you're weak, you're you're not ready. Um, Don't have a sluggishness about you. And so he's telling them, right? Didn't he already say to them? You guys can't handle it. You should be teachers by now. You're not. You're on the milk. You know, he's giving them a lot of a lot of admonishment saying, come on, come on, come on, come on. You're sluggish. You're dull of hearing. Why? Because you're still on the milk. You need the milk, but not a full diet of milk. You need to get onto the meat. You need to mature. You need to grow up. So you've got to do that. And why? He's saying that's evidence that you're growing in your faith, which is opposite of what he was warning about, about falling away. Right? Don't fall away. Don't fall back. Don't stop. You know, we talk about this all the time. You're either going forward or you're going back, right? There's a current in the water, and if you're not swimming forward, you're falling back. You're not just standing still. Nobody's standing still, okay? So if you're falling away, you're going backwards. You're going the wrong way. He's saying, don't be sluggish. Don't go backwards. Don't stop paddling. Swim faster. Get a hold of John and get next to him. If he's getting tired, then you carry him for a little while. And then you come along the other side and you carry him. Like, let's go. Grow up mature be be a man you know as paul says there i think it's first corinthians 14 you know don't don't be children in your understanding right he says be men in your understanding be children in malice but in understanding be men grow up right we're not told to 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 be children paul says that in ephesus too so that we would grow up and not be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine right that you be sound in doctrine you know what the bible teaches so when a false teacher gets up here and starts talking nonsense you know yeah there's something not right about that yep that's right red flags man okay it's like the crowd that comes to church every sunday that's it sure they go, and they go do their regular thing during the week and they just know there's no one ever learning or maturing well those are the ones that aren't saved too possibly we're gonna we're going to call it there. I skipped ahead of 12, but we're stopping there at 10. We got uh, we got time. So, yeah, I would say that kind of uh, what you were saying, Brooke, there, I think kind of helps us kind of helps us unpack, though, what, what we were talking about here um, for the majority of the night to say there are those who, you know, that John just explained, and, and there would be some of those in Brooke's camp saying, like, those are non-believers. But is it 
is it true though that a believer uh, that a true believer can be just coming to church on Sunday yeah, yeah. sure I mean, do we encourage that? No. You know, should they be plugged into Bible teaching and be under sound preaching and teaching and be at the Bible study? Should they be reading their word and studying their word at home on their own? Yes, 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 all that. But it doesn't mean that just because you only see so-and-so on Sundays that they're not saved. Right? We're, we're all on the treadmill, but we're on indi individual, independent treadmills. And we're all going at different paces and different speeds. And some of us have up the speed so that we can work out more we can build our endurance and our perseverance and some have never ever pushed the button to go from one to two they just are comfortable with just walking and crawling on the thing and so i'm saying to you yes could it be evidence that they're not saved yes but could it also be evidence that they are saved and that they're just immature like these people here and like paul talks about in corinth that they're just they're just they're getting stuff right they're here on Sunday, they're hearing the gospel being preached, they're hearing the word of God be taught, uh, and so I'm not sticking up for that by any means, because that shouldn't be the normal, that should not be the normal walk of a, of a believer, unless, you know, certainly all over the world it's, it's different. You know, if we're only meeting in a secret church on Sunday, and that's the only time we're gathering together, then praise the Lord, be there. But when the doors of the church are open, you know, under the pastors and the authority that you've subjected yourself to, you should be there and be under the preaching and the teaching of the word. And be there to do this, to encourage one another, to encourage me, to encourage you, you know, to, to, to continue in our maturity process and our growth like we're talking about. Um, so, anyways, I just want to clarify that, that we understand there are certainly those who are more mature in their faith. Uh, and that there can be this backsliding, you know, in seasons of, of your Christian walk. And that you, sometimes you're on a seven on the treadmill, sometimes you're on a two, right? Anybody understand the analogy? Uh, so that definitely can happen. So again, it's not for us to judge and say, well, you know, that person can't be saved because they only come to church, you know, once every two weeks or something. They just want to know. Or somebody come here and say, because my old lady's making me go. <laughs> <laughs> I meet people all the time that know that I go to church and I'm involved in church and they talk to me for my own And I You know, we got this for your kids. We got this on Monday night, this on Monday night. Sunday school starts at this time. You know, and then we never see them. <laughs> yeah. or, they, or they come to church, you know, and then once or twice, and then once again, again, it's fine, you know, but mm -hmm. you see it all the time. Sure. I don't see that church thing. What do I say? You do it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I know. I, I, it's for sure, you know. You hear people say, oh, you're, you know, you're a fanatical, you know, or just that mentality that people have about you. Man, you're, you're, you're real about your Christianity. Like, you're over the top. You're, you know, you're over the top. You're fanatical about your Christianity. And it's like, well, you know, yeah, I take it pretty seriously. Jesus what? took it pretty seriously when he died on the cross for me. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> he was, you know, yeah. The one that gets me is always, I believe in God, I don't want to go to church. I think you're missing out. So let us exhort one another, you guys. Let us encourage one another, as the writer does here, to uh, stand strong in the faith, man. Just keep swimming, right? As Nemo says, just keep swimming. Like, just keep eating. We got, we got to keep moving forward. <laughs> I missed it. What? Dory said it. Yeah, we'll get it to you. Sorry, Nemo the move. At least it's in Nemo. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yes, yes. Thank you. You know what I meant. Thank you. Actually, the second one's called Fun and Dory. Yeah. yeah, seen it. Time to leave. Pete, Pete's out of gummies. Pete's yeah, out of gummies. I can't, I can't listen anymore. Well, be encouraged, Pete. Um, there could be more gummies next week. But, uh, but yeah, keep fighting the good fight, guys. That's the point, right, that we're going to continue to, to grow and mature. And uh, we got to help one another. You know, we got to help each other. It's not always easy. All right, let's, uh, let's close. Somebody pray us. Pray us out of here. Who wants to do that? Who can close for us? I can do it. Thank you. Dear Lord, thank you for uh, this time and for us to come together in this group of men that uh, stays fast to your, to your love and to your word. 
I pray for all the men in this group and all those that are out there that couldn't be here tonight, that we have a good week, that we become godly men in everything that we do. Mm -hmm. We fight hard for our families, we fight hard for our faith. We go forth and have a great week in your name. Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Thanks.